Please welcome Professor Jasmine Fisher, Senior Researcher, Microsoft Research. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the invitation. I'm super excited to be here at home and speak in front of you. And uh, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for all these wonderful people, my family, my friends that I lost to cancer over the years. And um, if it wasn't for them, I would probably embark on a completely um, different path, but because of them, I decided to focus my work on cancer. And I don't think I need any fancy graphs or heavy statistics to convince you that this is something that touches on everyone's life. I'm sure each and every one of you here in the audience know at least one person that either suffers of cancer or died of cancer. So, uh, quite some time ago, I made a conscious decision to um, dedicate my work to develop these, as a biologist, to develop these technologies that will change the game, will change the way we do research, and in particular, will tackle this problem once and for all in a proper way. And uh, I think we need to start by asking ourselves the question, why is cancer so complicated, and why haven't we solved it by now? And uh, we need to understand that when we're talking about biological systems, living systems, cells, we're dealing with complexity that is astronomical. And we're dealing with uh, systems with millions of different entities, molecules, genes, proteins, that are all interacting with one another in parallel. And this whole soup of chemical is orchestrated by the various cellular machineries that make sure that everything happens in the right time and in the right place, and cells divide when they are supposed to divide, and they die when they are supposed to die. But unfortunately, and it's actually quite rare, Sometimes mistakes do happen, and then cells get out of control and start dividing in an uncontrolled manner. And behind me, you can see the various hallmarks of cancer, all the different processes that eventually lead to these cancerous processes. So when we're talking about cancer, when we're talking about dealing with cancer, we actually need to attack on all these different fronts. And on top of that, we need to remember that cancer doesn't have any purpose, it doesn't have any plan, it doesn't have any function. It simply evolves. And it evolves and it, it, it interacts with our, um, it reacts to our own genetic predisposition, to the environment, and it doesn't have a clear plan. So that's why it's so complicated to fix it and handle it. So what do we do about this? My uh, research group in Cambridge has been pioneering this new approach over the past 12 years that is called executable biology. And the idea is quite simple. The idea is to think about biological programs as computer programs and to use the same kind of techniques that we are using to uh, develop software and hardware and check that they actually do what they are supposed to do. This is a field that is called formal verification. We do that for biological programs. We verify biological programs. We make sure that they actually behave properly. That's the idea. Now, when we do that, when we build these kinds of models for biology, these computer programs that describe and mimic and simulate biological uh, processes, we can then figure out what is the exact set of instructions that tells the cell, what is the algorithm, what is the program that tells the cell to behave in a particular way, to divide, to move, to die, and so on. And by building these models, these computational models as we call them, and then comparing them to the actual experimental observations that we see in the lab, we can identify quite easily where the gaps are in terms of what we think the mechanism that explains a certain biological behavior is. So we can really see where the gaps are with what we think about the system and what we actually see from the lab. And uh, in order for this approach to actually be used hands-on by biologists, by clinicians. It has to be uh, accessible, and it has to be wrapped in a way that every biologist that is not a, a, a professional programmer can actually use these kinds of tools. And, in the, and behind me, you can see one such tool that has been developed in my um, 
group in, in Microsoft Research, where we developed this suite of different tools that are all done in a very uh, graphic, with a very, they all have very graphical uh, uh, um, user interface. And not only that the model is done like with a, a canvas where you can drag and drop the different entities, here you can see an example of a, a leukemia model with a cell and the gene insides and the interactions between them. Also, the sophisticated analysis that is running at the back end is then portrayed back in a very graphical and user-friendly uh, interface. And we do these kinds of models from um, um, a blood cancer. So we have different, we are modeling different types of, of cancers, uh, from blood cancers like leukemia all the way to uh, solid tumors. And um, I'll show you a few, a few examples. This is an example of how a leukemia model would look like, and this is a, a, one of the models that we, um, we've been building where we came up with clear predictions of, of new combinations of drugs that can be used in order to overcome a phenomenon that is called resistant. So there are many cases today in cancer where there are drugs, but over time the patients become resistant to the drug, and this is one of the major challenges today in cancer therapy. By building these kinds of models, we can look at the system in a much more broad sense and we can figure out all the different paths that the body can evolve around the drug and can find the route that will not allow this to happen. And that's what we've done with in, in this uh, context. But we, um, I just wanted to mention another thing that um, more recently, we've also started to work with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. My group is in particular uh, uh, working with, uh, with AstraZeneca. And here we've also been using uh, clinical data where we build these models based on patient-specific data. And then the predictions were also validated experimentally on the same uh, cell samples taken from the, from the patients. We're also working with neurosurgeons and radio-oncologists on the development of tumors that uh, uh, simulate a, a, the development of a, a very aggressive a, type of brain cancer called a glioblastoma. And what you can see here is a simulation of such a, such a tumor. Now, the way things happen in practice today is that a biopsy is taken from the patient, and then, in, in the best case scenario, grown in, in, in a Petri dish, and then all sorts of tests are done on the Petri dish, which can take weeks and even months what kind of chemo, what kind of radiation, what would be the best treatment for that particular patient. Because there's quite a huge variability between patients that are suffering from a glioblastoma, and there's a great need to tailor the treatment to the individual. By simulating these kinds of models, we can then mimic the effect of a, a, the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy, and in a matter of minutes, we can get an answer, what is the specific course of action for a particular patient with a particular genetics, with a particular uh, set of, of markers. So obviously, this, this kind of, uh, uh, these kinds of executable biology models have huge advantages in our fight on cancer. They give us new biological insights. They will allow us to identify new uh, drug targets and new combinations of drugs, and also to find smart ways to fight a, a strategies to fight a, a drug resistance. And in addition to the many efforts and many technologies that we have today to do better detection of cancer and better diagnostic of cancer, and also, as you heard uh, earlier from Adas, uh, also to monitor our uh, well-being, the idea that we can really build these computer models that will allow us to uh, compute uh, the mechanisms, the cancer mechanism, which will allow us to understand better the drivers of cancer, will also allow us to control them better, and will also pave the way for us to identify these bottlenecks across many different cancers so that we can then tackle them in the same manner that we use antibiotics against many bacteria. And this will really pave the way for better cancer treatments and also personalized cancer treatments. And I would like to end by saying that I'm not saying that we will eradicate cancer altogether, but I am saying that I honestly believe that 10 years from now, using these kinds of technologies and allowing us, which, which allows us to, which allow us to uh, control the drivers of cancer will solve the problem. And it will be a solved problem. 
Thank you.